Euh, bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue à, bienvenue à Take It Café. Euh, bonjour Joshua. Bonjour. Euh, J'espère que ça va bien. Euh, je vais commencer par à dire quelques mots sur Take It Café. Et, euh, alors Take It Café, c'est un, un mouvement qui a été, à Take It en fait, c'est un mouvement qui a été créé il y a quelques années par la Fondation Osmo et en particulier par Alan qui est avec nous. Et c'est un mouvement qui veut joindre la communauté tech à Montréal pour essayer de participer euh, à aider la communauté en général. Uh, so the idea is to to get the tech community together so that we can contribute to Montreal and make it a better city for everybody. We do this in partnership with uh, Centraide, whose mission is fighting uh, poverty and social exclusion uh, in Montreal. Uh, Take It Cafe is run by volunteers. So all the funds we raise and all the events we do uh, are costing zero. Uh, and basically any, anything that we raise goes 100% to, uh, to Centraide and they use it for their programs. Uh, so uh, Take It Cafe is one of the activities that uh, Take It does, but there are many, many other activities. Uh, and uh, we, uh, you can get involved in Take It in general by either joining one of the activities like you are here today, and we thank you for it. Uh, you can participate in building activities. So you can contact, contact us and uh, suggest ideas on what we can do for the community to be able to help. And uh, finally, you can do some donations. We're going to test something new today, which is, so since it's a cafe, the idea is that you can make donations that are very small, uh, sort of something like what you would pay for coffee, So if you feel like uh, making a small donation, you can just on the Zoom, uh, just say uh, un café s'il vous plaît or one coffee please. And then uh, somebody will contact you in private and send you the link so you can make the donation. And as I said, we are expecting very small donations. So feel comfortable to make it as small as, as you want. If it's above $20, uh, you will get a tax receipt. Uh, I'm going to do this in English. Um, mostly because we, we have people as well from outside Montreal or people who are more comfortable with English. So, uh, but if you feel like uh, asking questions in French or making interventions in French, please, uh, please do so. Uh, so obviously we are all here today uh, to hear Joshua. Uh, I first heard of Joshua probably 30 years ago. Uh, I was a student at the University of Montreal and I was uh, very interested in neural networks. And at the time, none of the professors knew anything about it. So we, had, we were a small group of students and we heard of a mysterious person at MIT who was working on neural networks. And that mysterious person was Joshua. And uh, I mean, Joshua later on, and at the time, so the reason we were not able to use it for practical applications that wasn't able to scale. And Joshua with Jeff Hinton, Jan LeCun and others uh, did a lot of work. Uh, to get us to where we are today, where uh, it's what we call deep learning. And today, when you hear of AI, uh, most of AI applications, I would say 99% of new AI things that you hear about today, whether it's GPT-3 or Alpha Zero or any of these achievements in AI have deep learning inside. So I'm really happy to have Joshua here. And uh, I mean, obviously Joshua has been in many forums and you probably all met him or uh, seen some of his presentation. So today I was planning to make it very zoomed on one topic, which is consciousness, which is a topic I know Joshua is interested in and has published in, and I know as well many of us are interested. Uh, so, uh, bienvenue Joshua, et merci d'être avec nous aujourd'hui. Merci de, de, de poser des questions difficiles. <laughs> uh, alors, ok, alors je vais commencer par la première question uh, difficile, c'est, uh, en fait, je vais poser une série de questions, comme ça, ça donne le temps de de réfléchir et de like, détendre ta réponse. Euh, Qu'est-ce qui t'intéresse qu dans la... What interests you in consciousness? What is the thing that made you interested to actually do active research in it? Uh, the second question is, what is your definition of consciousness? And the third question is probably a brief summary of, uh, like, for, for a general audience, Uh, so most people here are tech savvy, but not all of us are researchers or uh, software engineers. Uh, 
like a bit of insight of how we can start thinking about this and why is it interesting for machine learning? All right. So let's start with the first one, which is why I got into this. Um, why did I get into this? That's a good question. Uh, I think, um, well, first of all, there's a history of my interest in neuroscience and, and, and cognitive science and you know understanding how the brain works um, from uh, kind of almost day one where I got into neural nets when I was doing my master's around 1985. <laughs> um, I, I was attracted by the idea that um, uh, we could maybe understand how the brain works um, understand especially the part of our brain which gives us our intelligence and, um, and, and build machines that could be exploiting these principles. So uh, over the years in my career and with my uh, friends and collaborators in the field, um, we maintained a very strong connection between our work in AI, uh, computer science, and uh, our colleagues and collaborators uh, on, the, on the brain side of the, the research, neuroscience and COXI. And they've always, always had a presence at conferences we organize, uh, you know, with NeurIPS, uh, the um, a conference, um, the, the, the so-called Snowbird conference we organized in the 90s, and then iClear. Uh, if you notice, we always have invited speakers who are coming from uh, neuroscience and COXI. So I've had a long, you know, uh, uh, long, long lasting interest in understanding the brain, because if you want, it's been my secret recipe for success. Um, um, I've always tried to see, ask myself when I think about a new algorithm, um, you know, is that something that brains could do? And, uh, you know, what, what, what kind of knowledge could we draw from about uh, about brains that could inform how we could do this um, in terms of machine learning and, and, and AI. Now, in the past, I've been mostly focusing on like low level stuff, um, like how can the brain do backprop or something like this? Like, like it's, it's things happening at the level of synapses and the uh, circuitry um, of, uh, of cortex in particular. But um, in, in the early days of deep learning, like in the early 2000s, um, we, um, at least I had this, this, this dream um, that deep learning could help us discover high level representations of the world, which uh, would be the kind of abstract causal variables that um, humans think about, right? So I just said the word think, now you say, ah, hi, it's getting closer to consciousness, um, that humans talk about uh, and that help us understand how the world works. But it, it's always been sort of an elusive goal. Um, I don't think that our current deep learning methods, representation learning methods, discover something close to the kind of abstract variables that we consciously think about. And so in 2017, I realized that these high level variables that I would like our, my deep learning nets to discover in their top level representation, um, if they were like the, the sort of entities that I think about consciously, then there should be some constraints on how these variables are related to each other. And the constraint I thought about in 2017 was, and I had a paper called the consciousness prior, was basically that these, these variables, the entities that those variables are you know, talking about, they are related to each other in a sparse way. So what it means is um, that, the, the, the constraints or the statistical dependencies that, or the causal dependencies that exist between them involve very few variables at a time. And the reason I was thinking this was a good constraint is because when we think 
we can't think of more than a head full of things at a time. This is a bottleneck of our um, uh, working memory. Uh, you know, everybody's, you know, heard about like the seven plus or minus two things that you can hold in your, in your conscious uh, mind. And so, um, and at that time, like in 2016 and so on, I, I knew very little about actual consciousness literature and research. And it was all based on like introspection of like, you know, trying to see what is going on in my mind as I'm thinking, which I've been told time and again, this is very bad. Don't do that. Scientists don't do that. Don't, don't, don't try to figure out how your brain works by, by introspecting. But I think it's still a source of information. You have to be careful. And that's why cog scientists do experiments where they can uh, reject <laughs> uh, hypotheses that may have come from uh, self-observation and, and uh, might be wrong. So in any case, I started reading a bit of that literature and I discovered there was a, uh, you know, one of the dominant theories of uh, consciousness called the global workspace theories. Uh, and there are some several variants of them that, that are really based on, on this same notion that I thought was um, the presence of this bottleneck, uh, which we all experience. So it's kind of almost a no brainer that you, you have something like this going on. Um, yeah, so it, it got me into thinking when maybe we should pay attention, not just to the like low level neural information that neuroscientists typically uh, think about, but that uh, the work that is happening in, in cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience now uh, could help us design better machine learning methods. Um, and um, uh, you know, there is something that has changed from the 80s, um, which is we now have machines, um, uh, fMRI, uh, that can observe what's going on in your brain, at least at, at, a, at a course level, while you're doing tasks, while you're thinking about something. And then we can ask you, you know, what were you thinking about? And we can see uh, which part of your brain was lighting up and so on. And so that window into the brain, that's really neuroscience, has actually helped to uh, understand a little bit about what may be going on uh, in, in our brain when we're conscious of something versus another thing or where we're not conscious of something. What are the differences between those states of mind? And, and, um, and so the science of consciousness was actually born in, in the 80s and 90s in the sense that it wasn't just philosophy, like you know, theorizing about what consciousness might be, but more and more um, doing actual experiments based on observations uh, in neuroscience and cognitive science that has helped shape a number of theories. And, and we still don't know what consciousness is, but um, that's uh, the important thing is we now have a scientific handle on consciousness and it's just a beginning. So that was the first question, why I got into it. What was the second one again? I don't have so, a very uh, long term memory is, here. What do you mean when you say consciousness? Oh yes, okay, so what, what I, do, I, do I mean? Yeah, um, so, so he, here's my answer. Um, we shouldn't, so I think a mistake that people have done in the past is trying to define consciousness as a starting point for the, re the research. But that's not really the scientific approach. So if you're, think about life, which is another like incredible phenomenon. Um, a few hundred years ago, uh, scientists were trying to define what is life. This was before, you know, DNA and, and, and uh, understanding biology uh, at the level that we do today. Um, and they came up with all kinds of crazy things. Um, and a lot of the ideas then meant uh, we were, were around life as being something quasi magical that distinguished, there was something like a spark of life, you know, something that was uh, almost divine uh, in living beings versus not living beings. And, and, and if you use your own introspection and your own sensations, this is how it feels like, you know, living things seem to be like so fundamentally different from the non-living things. But as biology progressed and we understood better what, what it meant to be alive, you know, and, and that there's, there's almost a continuum um, 
of uh, of things that are more or less alive, with viruses being the the least alive, right? Um, uh, the magic that people thought about regarding life uh, kind of vanished. It dissolved into the theories and observations of living things that biology has given us. So why do I tell you this story about life? Because I think something similar um, is going to happen with consciousness. Uh, that right now, and, and you know, especially a few decades ago, um, it may look a little bit magical. Right. And but that's because we don't understand it. And so I'm not going to give you a definition of consciousness. And I think that the scientific way of answering this instead is to try to see, okay, so what are the actual phenomena that we can observe? What is going on in the brain that is associated with consciousness? And uh, if we have theories to explain what is going on, can we test them? Do they make sense uh, mathematically in the case of the approaches that I, you know, I'm interested in? Do they make sense in a machine learning sense? Like, is this something useful? And then is this something we can see in the brain? Um, so um, instead of answering, and trying to answer the question of like, what is consciousness? Because we don't have the answer. Um, let's see, what are the functions of consciousness? Like, so what happens when you're conscious and in, in, what's, in what ways is that? Um, useful. So why do I say in what way is that useful? Because I believe that consciousness, like everything else, you know, that comes out of our body uh, is a result of evolution. And if we have consciousness, it's probably because it's useful. Um, or it's a side effect of something else that is useful. But if we don't understand the underlying mechanisms, it's going to be hard to, you know, uh, um, to understand what consciousness is. And so the focus is on the mechanisms. It's like, you know, what is going on in your brain? And, and then the machine learning where AI can be helpful here is it can help us understand why it, it could be useful. So how, how do we do that? Well, we can do machine learning. Let's say we have a theory of uh, some property of conscious processing. Well, we can build machines that incorporate that um, uh, bias, that inductive um, the preference for solutions that, that include that property. And we can see if that endows those machines with an advantage. And we can see experimentally by running simulations, but we can also uh, theorize because we have a lot of understanding of uh, machine learning theory, why it could be useful. So, so that's how I would answer the question of what is consciousness. I would not give you a definition. I would tell you, we have to uh, you know, break, it down in, break it down into the pieces Right, just like we did for life, um, and um, and what I think is that what sounds very mysterious right now about consciousness will dissolve into scientific understanding, exploration, theories, and you know observation experiments and so on, the usual uh, scientific method, as we make progress. And you know maybe it's going to take decades, but I don't see. I mean, unless you believe that some godlike entity is putting consciousness into us and I don't believe that, then it means that consciousness is coming out of, you know, the physics of our bodies. And this is something that we could, you know, we should be able to eventually understand. And so let's try to figure it out. So in a way, I mean, actually this is a very nice way to think about it is that in the same way that ev once evolution, so instead of thinking what is life is once you understand the mechanism of evolution, then the question yes. becomes slightly less relevant because the mechanism gives you like you, you knew something yeah. that was approximately life. You talk about it, but you don't know exactly what it is. Then evolution gives you a mechanism. Now you know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, and about. the nice thing about evolution is that it, it, it helps you understand not just what the mechanism does, but why it evolved, because it has evolutionary you know, survival value or something like this. Right, you expect a similar insight to emerge because evolution was one insight, right? So. Like before, no, no, but I, I think evolution evolution, evolution explains both life and consciousness. Well, evolution, I no because we still don't evolution. Uh, I think if I if I read evolution now, I understand life, but I still don't understand consciousness. So I think there's no, an additional we, insight that needs to arise. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I'm saying I'm saying evolution. I think evolution will help us explain consciousness in the sense that the mechanisms that we will uncover and we're starting to uncover. Um, 
will you know be will have a a utility for yes. the survival reproduction or whatever of of uh, these intelligent beings having consciousness i mean it's, it has to fit within the framework of evolution exactly but there's i feel there's a missing insight like we need an additional theory or an oh, additional yeah. mechanism of course yeah, yeah we there's all still a lot evolved organisms some of them are conscious because they have this mechanism and that's that yeah. but do you think it's one like it's one is going to be one i know we don't know the answer but are you expecting to be one thing like evolution or it will be a bunch of little things that if you connect together you understand consciousness so i think that consciousness may not be like a, a unified thing that you may have different aspects to it and that maybe different species have uh, some of them and maybe we we have more of them or something maybe not maybe we're not the most conscious species on earth um and and we don't need to assume that it's like one simple recipe that gives all the answers um and that's exactly why we need to study um you know uh, the details of what is actually going on and and have theories that we can test about that so Yosho, I'm going to try to understand what you said about sparse, uh, sparseness. Yeah. And uh, probably by understanding it, other people will understand as well. So sparseness, it means few, right? Yes. So, it means, uh, so is the idea is that um, I have, let's assume that everybody knows what a neural network is, that there's a neural network, and then there's a bunch of, bunch of nodes at, at one level. Is the sparseness idea is that uh, only a few nodes will be activated uh, at any moment in a meaningful way. Right. No, it's not exactly that. It's um, so. Let me explain a little bit the global workspace theory. Um, so the global workspace theory says that um, we have different modules in the brain, and they they can be activated as much as they want. I mean, in the sense that there is no constraint here of how much work they're doing. The constraint is about how they communicate with each other. So the brain is too large for having an all to all connectivity. So we have like 80 billion neurons and each neuron can only talk to about 10,000 others. So there's a big gap here, right? Um, so how do different parts of the brain talk to each other to coordinate? They can't talk to everyone at the same time. So the global workspace theory is saying that the way that they talk to each other is through a bottleneck. So, which presumably would be somewhere like in the frontal part of your brain. Um, and this bottleneck corresponds to the things that go into the bottleneck are the things that you're conscious of. So you can see it's a very, very small bottleneck. In fact, you know, a question that I'm you know, thinking about is why is it so small? Like we could have a bigger bottleneck. So there's gonna be value, like evolutionary value to the smallest of the bottleneck. So uh, going back to the global, global workspace theory, it says um, the, 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 this, th those modules compete to write into the working memory. They compete against each other and only one or very few at a time are able to put something there and everything that is in, in, the, in the global workspace uh, uh, is going to be broadcast to every everyone. So, you know, in terms of circuitry, right? Uh, if all to all is not possible, you can create like a, a central hub where everybody's connected to the central hub and the central hub is connected to everybody. So that's, that's a feasible yeah. wiring diagram, right? And that's the global workspace. Does that correspond to your current yes. thinking about the best hypothesis we have? Yeah, now how that, uh, hub is implemented neurally there, it's not necessarily like there's a bunch of neurons that do that. It could be more subtle than that. Um, but but at a conceptual level, you can think that there is such a bottleneck. How, you know, how it's implemented may be subtle. Uh, for example, it may be that um, um, there's, so what we observe when you're conscious of something is that the the, the modules that are selected, they, they become hyperactive. Um, it's like if they were lighting up um, and, and, and now they can communicate to different parts of the brain 
in a stronger way. And then that gets, and it doesn't have to be to a single place, right? But, but there is this competition through inhibition uh, mechanisms that, that make only one or a few of these modules um, a sort of win the, that, uh, that, 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 that race. Excellent. And then that's, so then the, the content of that workspace is what we call consciousness. Yes. Is, is and, what, and, no, well, it's, it's what we are conscious of. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And we have, a, and there's a memory as well. So we, we, it, it's both a place where you, you, you know, you have the different modules, right? And then it's broadcast, but it's also a place that remembers the last few things that were there, because this is how you're going to connect. So let me go back to the sparsity. The, those last few things that have come to consciousness, they interact with each other. So, it, you know, the, the idea of a workspace is that in that workspace, now you can uh, compute things that involve only uh, these elements that are there. So the things that are uh, that you're conscious of, they interact with each other um, in, in a way that allows you to figure out you know, whether they make sense, for example, um, that they, they're coherent with your understanding of reality um, or how to predict one thing given a few other things and uh, how, or to, how to imagine. So you can use that to imagine the next thing when you're planning or you're just imagining. Um, it's, it's, it's conditioned heavily uh, on, on, on what's in, 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 the works, in, in this global workspace. So for example, uh, there are these very nice, there's this video you, you should look at uh, of, uh, uh, people playing uh, like balls and throwing the ball to each other. And you ask the, the, the viewer to count how many passes they're making or something like this. And, 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 um, and while they're passing the ball, there is somebody disguised in a gorilla going through the scene. And most people don't see the gorilla. I mean, except if you knew because you've seen that yeah. thing before. So now I spoiled it for you. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so, so what's going on here? Um, because your conscious processing is focusing on, I need to count how many passes, um, it, it, it's blind to the, these other things that don't matter for counting uh, the number of passes, like the presence of the gorilla, even though it's, it's a weird thing that you should like, even yeah. if you notice otherwise. Uh, so what's going on is if you look in your brain, uh, the gorilla is there somewhere in, in you know, early phases of your visual processing, but it never wins the competition to go into your consciousness. That's why you're not conscious of it. Yeah, because so basically uh, it's not being written into the workspace. Exactly. Uh, because uh, for some reason you conditioned the entry point to say, well, I don't care about gorillas at this moment in my life. Exactly. Interesting. And so, uh, so this is from a neuroscience perspective. Yes. Do you see, or are there already applications of this in machine learning. So are there any yeah. systems that use this mechanism to perform better than other systems? Yes, I mean, that's what a lot of my research has been in the last couple of years uh, with uh, many of my grad students. Um, so why would this whole thing be useful for uh, machine learning? Well, uh, there are many good reasons and you know, I give, I give talks about this, uh, but let me try to summarize. Um, one of the big challenges of machine learning uh, that uh, is a kind of a hot topic in, in the field right now is how could we build machines that can generalize far from the training data in uh, like new circumstances? We call this out of distribution generalization. Or how could we adapt quickly to a new task, a new setting? Um, uh, and, um, and this is challenging because like all of their, the theory that we have for machine learning is based on the notion that the test data, the, the field application of the system is going to be uh, examples from the same distribution that look like similar in nature to the examples we've used for learning for tra the training set. Uh, if you don't have this uh, match between the test distribution and the training distribution, then Theory, you know, everything goes, you know, haywire, and you can't guarantee that your machine learning system is going to work. But yet, in the real world, if like if you're a company and you build systems, this is this is what's going to happen. Like 
you you train on on data from say some hospitals and really uh, you're going to apply this in a different country, uh, different province, things are different. Also things change because, well, the world is non is non stationary. You know, uh, the future is not like the past, and and so we build systems that, on paper, uh, in the lab experiments, have a good performance. But then when we deploy them, you always lose something, and you could lose a lot. In fact, the the systems we have today are not robust enough. So what's connect? What's the connection with conscious processing and 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 these ideas that I mentioned earlier? Well. Um, so, uh, in order to generalize, and now I'm going to bring in also causality because that's a related topic. In order to generalize in new settings, what we would really uh, need is that the learner builds a good model of how the world works. Like, uh, I'm going to give an example. Um, um, let's say you, you're learning how to drive in Montreal, but then years later, you make a trip to London and you rent a car. And now, you know, you have to drive on the other side of the road. Um, so there's like the physics and, and the social aspects of driving are essentially the same. It's just that we flip one bit somewhere that says you, you drive on the right versus you drive on the left. Um, and um, if you try to drive in London without really thinking about it consciously, you're going to make an accident. Your, your habitual, uh, what we call system one uh, circuits that don't involve conscious processing. You have to explain what circuit system one is. Joshua. Yeah, yeah, I'm going, that's what I'm doing now. So okay. system one behaviors are things you can do without thinking about it. Uh, a lot of perception is like this. Uh, when you're driving in a familiar environment in your usual car and so on, uh, usual route, system one is taking over. I can talk with somebody at the same time as I'm driving. Maybe I shouldn't, but we all do it because it works, okay? Um, now, if you're in London in the scenario that I was talking about, system one is not flexible enough. So system one is like our current deep learning. It's good at some task that it has practiced a lot. But if we change the setting, um, it could screw up badly. So what happens when you're in London in this car? Um, you, you know, you've, you're, you've been told that in London, you know, you have to drive on the left. So that's like high level knowledge. And now you're gonna start driving, paying a lot of attention, conscious attention on what's going on, where the cars are coming from. Always keeping in mind, I have to drive on the left. I have to drive on the left. I have to be careful not to go back on the right. Um, and initially you're not gonna be very good at it, but at least you survive. Like you're not gonna make an accident. And most people at least. Uh, so here our system two has taken over um, and is making sure that we're um, controlling our body in a way that's consistent, for example, with these rules that we were told about, but we have no practice of. Now, as you know, if I spend a whole week there, um, I practice driving in London, I get better at it. And eventually I don't need to pay as much attention. So there's a gradual shift here from system two to system one. System two is now training system one so that it does the right thing in London. So, uh, um, so the workspace idea is because I have a very small number of things in this workspace, I can shuffle them easier than if it was billions of things interacting. Is that? Um, yeah, so, so uh, the rule, for example, you know, how you, you know, drive on the left, drive on the right, it's a very simple rule. It's expressed at this level where the, the knowledge, which we call, I call verbalizable knowledge, has this property that uh, each piece of uh, knowledge involves very few variables. Like driving on the right involves a few things about, you know, what, what a road, uh, you know, has two sides and when you drive, you, you stay on, on, on one side and it depends on which country you are, which side you should drive. So there's this very simple things. We can verbalize those rules. Um, this is very different from the kind of rules that govern how we 
uh, recognize that there is a car in the image. That involves millions of pixels with complicated interaction. System one does these things, is very good at it. But if we change things in a, like a single bit has flipped here, system one might not be behaving properly. And that's where system two comes in. And they collaborate together in order to solve the problem. And eventually system two trains, which you know, keeps making sure that you're doing the thing that is coherent with the rule you've learned. Um, eventually it trains system one to, to learn how to do that. And then you don't need to think about it anymore. Ah, interesting. So, the, so which means what the things you are conscious of in, in this, using this approach are the things that you don't know very well. And once you learn something sufficiently, you should, yes. for efficiency purposes, move it out into system yes. one. Which so it becomes automatic efficient. because it's it's a rare resource. You know, this bottleneck is a rare resource. So you want only to use it where you need it. And in fact, the more you use it, the more fatigue you get. So if you have to think too much for a long time, you kind of want to take a break. Um, so there's a, you know, a lot of interesting things. Now, the connection to causality is the following, that... Um, in order for this whole thing to work, you need to, you know, when something changes in the world, like we need to drive on the right, uh, in order to adapt quickly to this, we need to make sure that our understanding of the world has decomposed knowledge in the right pieces, such that when there is a shift going from Montreal to, to London, uh, we can attribute that shift to a single bit here, or, you know, very few variables have changed. If we have a model of the world, which, has the notion of this abstract notion that you drive on the left or you drive on the right, it's easy. But the, so the challenge from a machine learning perspective is how do we learn a model of the world where we decompose our knowledge into these pieces and variables, these high level variables that have that property that when things change in the world, um, they're localized, they, they correspond to like one thing. Well, that's what humans do. We build these models of the world, and then we use language um, to communicate about that high-level knowledge with, with others. Um, so uh, how is that connected to causality? Well, people who study causality have um, uh, hypothesized, based on physics, that uh, we can understand the world uh, as uh, like a legal blocks, each legal block corresponding to a mechanism, like some law of physics that can be applied in different places. And, um, and, and these, these legal blocks tell you how things are causally related to each other. You, know, uh, you enter some causes, output some effects. And, and, the, and by connecting these legal blocks, you can explain what's going on around you. These legal blocks are like the, the, the laws of physics or, or you know, and maybe more complicated laws like uh, about social interactions and stuff. Um, and, what, what they say is that uh, typically when things change in the world, it's because somebody has intervened in one place in you know, one of these legal blocks. We change the constant of gravity when we go from earth to the moon. We change the, you know, where we should drive left or right when we go from Montreal to London. One thing's, one thing's changed. Um, and uh, if you assume that a lot of the, most of the changes are like this, it becomes much easier from a machine learning perspective to figure out those changes, to, to adapt to those changes. So the, you know, the, the, the hypothesis about the bottleneck is connected to that uh, the world at some level, the, the verbalizable knowledge can be explained in, as these um, uh, sparse dependencies where very few variables are involved in each, like a bunch of rules basically. Uh, they could be more complicated than symbolic rules, but but they have a similar nature that involve few things at a time because that's what the bottleneck enforces. Yes, right. I have a million questions, but uh, right. I'm going to, I promise people to answer to ask their questions. So we have a few questions on Twitter. I'm going to all right uh, read them for you. Uh, so uh, the first one is uh, from uh, Aditya Joshi. And he's asking if you are familiar with the direction of Donald Hoffman, uh, that what Donald Hoffman is taking to explain consciousness. I'm not, um, but um, if I look him up, um, I see that he's focusing on the hard problem of consciousness. So maybe maybe I should say a few words about this. Yes, um, 
So there's philosophers uh, have introduced this notion uh, that there's an easy problem and a hard problem. Uh, and the idea is that the easy problem would be like the stuff I've been talking about. In other words, what happens kind of mechanically in your brain uh, that explains the, the, the conscious processing. And then there is the hard, which you know they say, well, we will figure this out. Um, but then there is the hard problem, which many people think we can't figure out um, that has to do with the feeling of being conscious of something, the um, uh, uh, what's called qualia, um, the the sensation that uh, something is 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 red or is warm, uh, isn't just information that's going to my brain, but there is this hard to define. Uh, 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 sensation that that uh, uh, um, they call the, 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 the hard problem of, of consciousness. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, I'm, I, I haven't read his work, but, but I, I know that, I, but just looking at him that he's been focusing on this. Um, so this kind of subjective experience uh, is something that maybe is, is harder to explain. Now, the, the, personally, I think we'll explain it. And in fact, there is a theory coming from cognitive science that has been proposed in the last decade that I think makes a lot of sense from a machine learning perspective to explain uh, this experience, this subjective experience that's associated with consciousness. Um, it, it's a theory from uh, somebody called uh, Michael Graziano, uh, who's a cognitive scientist. And um, his theory is saying that um, there is a part of our brain that is modeling what the rest is going to be doing. So it's like a model of the, our, think of mostly what our brain is doing is modeling how the world works, say, and how we can act in order to you know, achieve things. Um, and then there is another part that is modeling what the brain is doing. And, and in particular, um, where it's going to attend. So the, with the, the global workspace theory, there's a notion of uh, I'm going to attend to this and then I'm going to attend to that. And this is going to form the content of my conscious uh, workspace. Um, and if you think of attention as a kind of action that the brain takes, and there's a lot of, there's some evidence that um, from the point of view of the brain, attending is just like a muscle. It's like an internal computation you decide what to compute over. Um, and it's, it's processed in a way similar to other muscles. It's just that it's not a muscle that influences what's going on outside. It's an internal muscle that controls the computation itself that we are doing. Uh, and in the same way that we have a, when, you know, if you look at how the brain controls uh, external things with muscles, uh, we have a controller. A controller is like something that's like a little model of the world that allows us to decide you know, how to move our muscles in order to achieve something. Well, if, if attention is an internal muscle, there's also a controller that is a simplified model of you know, what would happen if I attend this and then that, and then can in a way plan, you know, decide what to attend in order to achieve something. So that model of our brain is like a mini brain on top of the brain, and that may uh, give us this separation between um, the uh, like actual computation uh, that the brain does, like the, the, the quantities that uh, we're uh, going to be conscious of, and the special uh, uh, thing that is happening in our brain when um, this simplified model is deciding to pay attention to something, right? So uh, it's a theory. Um, the important thing is, I, I don't think there is any reason to uh, believe that we won't be able to come up with an explanation for the qualia. Qualia is something that is happening in your brain. This, the perception of something happening that you're conscious of is something we can measure. We can see that it's different depending on you know, whether you're uh, consciously experiencing it or not. 
And so I think eventually we will figure it out. But what's interesting is there are already some theories about Coelia. Uh, I don't think they have been tested very much, but, but I, they can also drive um, what it means if those theories are correct. And, and if we build other theories like them, is that we should be able to build machines that, that have also subjective experience. Uh, Joshua, there is a question from the audience. Uh, what's the introspection, and it's relating to what you just said, is what's the intros introspection on system one or two performing? And what's the feedback loop? Uh, sorry, jump. What's the feedback loop uh, that uh, between, uh, but, and does it take from the consciousness bad bandwidth? Yeah, I'm not sure I understood the question. Um, I can mush the words and give you an answer. Uh, let let uh, me read it again because I think it's uh, okay. so. So, what is the link between system one and system two? Okay. And what is the feed? Uh, what's the feedback loop between them? And does okay. the feedback loop actually consume some of your consciousness bandwidth? I right, right, right. Be related to yeah, I mean, system. anytime you use system two, you're you're using some of that bandwidth that has that's very limited, and that would explain probably why there is a kind of pressure to not use it uh, if it's not really needed. Um, now, so once you understand, so, so here's a, another way to think about system one and system two. There are different aspects of reality that our brain is modeling. And some of them are, let's say, the knowledge about the world that is verbalizable. And then there is the knowledge about the world that is not verbalizable. So verbalizable means I can like, in a few sentences, I can tell you about it and you can understand what it is. Um, and not verbalizable, well, actually a lot of AI has been, you know, uh, classical symbolic AI was facing that, that wall. It, it's hard to write a program for things we can't verbalize, um, but that's what machine learning has enabled uh, using data and examples. We can learn, we can train the machine to figure out that knowledge that we can't verbalize, but with a lot of examples, the machine can learn system one. Okay. so that's roughly to remind you what system one and system two are and how they're different. They, they, they capture different aspects of reality. Now they work together also uh, in, in many ways. Uh, so first of all, of course, system one, you know, extracts information from, from uh, your sensors uh, in a form that makes it easy for system two to, to work with. So they, this is the original dream of deep learning. We extract these high level variables on which we can do things like reason. Um, um, so that's one obvious thing. Uh, a less obvious thing is that system two is also involved in imagination or planning, where you think of possibilities that, that or counterfactuals, things that haven't happened but could have happened or should have happened or might happen. So these sort of things is, system two is involved in, but it doesn't do it alone. Um, when you're planning a path, um, or you, you're thinking about a solution to a problem, like a programming problem or whatever, a math problem, it's not like you're you're consciously uh, screening through, through millions of different solutions and then picking one. It doesn't feel like that's what you're doing. What seems to happen is magically, potentially good solutions pop up in your mind, right? Um, and, and so where are these magically you know, uh, good solutions coming from. They're coming from system one. System one may have like a Jarjav model that can create candidates. And then system two is 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 saying, yeah, this is good. Uh, this looks coherent with the, the system two knowledge I have. So I'm going to go for it um, or not. So uh, Joshua, let me see if I understand the picture you're painting. So we have a workspace. Yeah. And let's say system one, is collecting information from the world. And then then all of these things are competing and a few of them are popping up in the workspace. That's right. And then the consciousness uh, theory that, is it Brazzini? Like? Uh, um, so Bars was the one who created the original global workspace theory. And then uh, later I talked about Graziano who talked about uh, the uh, theory about Qualia uh, coming about from Quelia. controlling the attention. So, so then, okay, whether, I'm not sure if that's the right thing, but then I, the people, the planning is happening on, uh, the planning is happening as if the world is, is, the, is the workspace. So now right. the workspace, 
uh, now the planner only sees the world as workspace, but it uses mechanisms similar to system one to roll forward, to roll right. backwards. We're not conscious. We're not conscious of the controller. Right? Like we don't no. know why we're paying attention to something. It's not something we have conscious access to. So it, it seems like a bit mysterious that you know suddenly we decide to pay attention to something and then something else. But it, there's a logic, and that is embedded in this uh, controller that decides where we attend next. So I, I have another question from Twitter, and uh, this is complicated, so I'm going to read it slowly. The first right. one is because uh, it's from Enrique Osorio Franco, and uh, he first asked about causality, which you addressed. The second part is very difficult to understand, so I'm going to read it slowly. Probably you can parse it. So he asked, if you consider as a hypothesis, platonic universals and humans having the same transcendental way of dealing with them that machines are far from memory, mi mirroring. So, okay, so I think by them he means causality. So does he think that humans have a transcendental way of dealing with causality that machines are unable to mirror? Well, I certainly don't think that, that humans have anything that machines could not eventually uh, mirror. And the reason is very simple. It's because we are machines. I mean, it's like people have a hard time with the sentence, but we are machines that are very different machines from the machines we currently build. Uh, we are machines that have been evolved through evolution. Um, living beings are very complicated machines. Biology is, when you understand biology, you know, we are machines and then the building blocks are proteins and all that, right? Um, so, you know, maybe it's gonna be difficult to figure out um, that machine, but uh, there is no reason to think we couldn't. Now, going back to the, the platonic understanding of the world. So the model of the world that, that uh, humans have in their head is, is just a model as usual. Right? It's not the real thing. It's, it's a very simplified picture of how the world works. And we use language to try to synchronize each other's models uh, and it never works perfectly and we fight each other and so on. Um, but um, um, yeah, I don't, I think that the concepts, the high level concepts that we use to understand the world that, and, and we verbalize, they are just tools. They're, they, they don't have to be perfect you know, at predicting what's gonna happen, but they're, these abstractions, they don't have to correspond to the real underlying causal structure of the world. Because the real causal structure of the world is like quantum physics, it's happening at, at, at a scale that we can't really do any you know, computation over. over. So it's like our brain has come up with these abstractions that are not the real thing. Like when we say there's a cat, there is no cat. It's, it's like it's complete construction, but it's a very convenient construction. It's one that allows us to make predictions about the future that are useful for us. So there is no, it's not like there's an, an underlying reality that we describe. It's more like we build a model of the world that's useful for us. It allows us to uh, you know, survive and, and navigate the world and, and, and do things together. Joshua, we have only five minutes and I feel that I have not given people their fair share of answering questions. Would you be opposed to us sending us sending you the questions later and probably answering them briefly on text? Sure. Are you, I mean, well, I will see, I'll ask you later. I will see later. I might, we might do it, we might not do it. Uh, I'm going to pick a question from Twitter as well because I see too many questions on chat that I can't do it in a fair fashion. Uh, so, uh, there is a question from Joseph Viviano. Mm -hmm. uh, consciousness is a limited bandwidth interface that can process combinations of representations learned yes. throughout life in a general purpose way. Exactly. Can we learn uh, general representations such that are such that they are compatible with conscious processing without everything being consciously processed? Uh, without everything being well. Yeah, so there's system one and system two. So there's a part of the computation that is not accessible to consciousness. That's the system one part. Um, but I want to pick up on something that uh, Joseph said, which I didn't have time to explain, uh, connecting to how we can get better out of distribution generalization. So I mentioned causality and uh, you know interventions, uh, but there's another uh, side to this, which is connected. Um, so he mentioned that... Uh, what we do when we bring things to consciousness is um, we can compose them in new ways. 
And that's what of the power of generalization that you get in language. For example, we can uh, create new sentences where there are a new subject, a new verb, a new object. We've never put these things together, but there are many combinations that even though they never uh, appeared in, in, our, in our training set, uh, they do make some sense, or sometimes they don't make sense um, unless you make an assumption, like if I write a science fiction story. So we are able to generalize to new combinations of things we are used to, even if these combinations are unlikely. And, and, and this allows us to face novelty. So one of the big uh, advantages of system two is that it allows us to face novel scenarios like the driving in London scenario, where we can combine the pieces of knowledge we already know in novel ways. So the pieces are known, like I know how to drive, I know like how to press the, the levers and so on. Uh, it's just that some little things have changed and I need to combine my pieces of knowledge in a new way. We can do that on the fly with system two. Uh, it's th so it has this flexibility of combining pieces of knowledge and modules in a, in a dynamic way that system one doesn't have. And that's very powerful and, and allows us to generalize better to new scenarios. Uh, you're sure we have only two minutes left. So uh, I will leave it for you just to give us your final thoughts about what you would love to happen in the next 10 years uh, in that space. Right. Um, it's just you know, grinding through the process of the scientific method uh, with collaborations between neuroscientists, cognitive neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, and, and AI people, I think we can make a lot of progress in understanding what seems right now like a mystery that's been touted by some people of one of the greatest mysteries for science to, to figure out um, science or philosophy uh, because we, there's so much we don't understand. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident we can we can figure it out uh, using our reason and our tools to experiment. Unless of course we kind of self-destruct by not managing climates and other things properly. So we have to do two things simultaneously, avoid disruption yes. while continuing this research. That's, that's why I'm also investing in AI for social good applications of uh, machine learning. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Joshua. And thank you everybody for coming here and uh, for having this discussion. We'll be sharing it uh, on uh, TechAid website. And uh, thanks again. Have a great week.